nunners is plentiful. All your stuff feeds on the fiddlers, nunners, and small crabs, and you have a lot of small fish, small trout, and small sand perch, and spot, and you spotted trout goes way up in them marshes and spawn a lot of them, Bill. You can must ride an oyster, fish, or crab, or you can hunt if season's in, go out just for a day and pick up some nice corks and different things. Poop weed and wall spargers, these mussels and oysters and soft shell clams, you just will say now 100% of our stuff comes from the water. That's no farming or nothing like that anymore around these places. It's just, it all comes out of the water. We don't get it. I like to hunt along the banks. I think it's a whole lot more sport. I don't get a whole lot of kick out of hunting on land. It seems like it's more fun hunting on the water edges. There's something about the edges that loves life. I, I'm, I'm a blue crab. I, I love the edges. I love the overlaps of the forests and the fields and those brushy creek bottoms that are in the seams of the landscapes. That's where you find nature in her greatest abundance and diversity. And there's no edge that's more special to me than the gentle merge of the land and water that forms our Chesapeake shore. We say the bay is about, uh, what, 180, 200 miles long. But you just imagine how that shoreline twines down through the marsh and the creek and the beach and gut and mud flat. You straighten out of that edge and it stretched from here on past California and back with a whole lot left over. And that's just the obvious part. Once the land slips out beneath the water, it runs shallow for a long way. If you're to show the bay on a, a model to say like the size of a football field, well on that scale the depth of all the water in it would average about the thickness of three dimes. Now, that bay looks long and it's broad, but it's thin. It's mighty thin. It's, in, it's those shallow edges, warmed by the sun and fed and nurtured by the marshes where so much of the life hangs out. The edges, that's where the action is. It's uh, what gives the bay its character. It's where its personality lies. It's uh, where it wants to rise right up. And the swans come down from tundra to Chesapeake and then return. Lazy floating feather, watch it turn, oh, watch it turn. Lazy floating feather, watch it turn. If you're looking for wildlife, you have to look around the edge. Most of the birds will follow where the food is. One of the most exciting times in the fall is when the swans are coming back into the Chesapeake Bay. The late Sir Peter Scott, who was studying the same species of swan, and he says, oh, you've had a swan fall, the lovely term, when the swans are coming in on migration. In the fall, they do a non-stop flight of something like 1,200 miles. They come in from very high, and you can see them coming down with their wings arched and their necks arched and their legs out, losing height. Then they come swishing into the bay, the swan fall. It's a wonderful sight. The swans are very, very important indicators, big and they're romantic. And when in the early 1970s, they started moving en masse into the fields, they were telling us something, that the bay was not in very good shape because swans are grazers, they're feeders of aquatic vegetation. They prefer to be feeding in the water. And when they came out into the fields, it was quite obvious to me that something was wrong with the bay. It's the light that failed. And that's killed the vast and lush meadows of grass that, that carpeted the bay shallows. How did it happen? <laughs> well, you follow the Chesapeake down through 40 rivers that branch and branch again down through uh, well, our near one-fifth of our country that lies uh, between Maine and Florida. You think of all 
of that land and every drop of water that runs off of it has got to flow into the bay. You add to that the discharge from every sewage plant and every factory. And, it's, and that rain is carrying the fertilizer from farms and dirt, from land clearings, and each quart of waste oil and every styrofoam cup that gets pitched into some roadside ditch. That's what we mean when we say Bay's watershed. The Bay water and watershed are as linked as a, as a tree is to the soil it's rooted in. Pollution coming off of that watershed sewage, farms, development. That made the water cloudy. It killed the light, and it killed those grasses. Now, the loss of, of anything in nature never affects just one thing. That's the lesson of ecology. If we uproot the grasses, we risk uprooting a whole unique subset of Chesapeake life and culture. It's all connected. A scrape boat is made to go in real shallow water. That's where most of the crabs is. They go in them places to hide, to shed. All things have to have that grass to survive in. It's good for our fish. Our ducks has to depend on it. Small fish, oysters, soft-shell clams, pennywinkles, and wilks. The grass is connected to the blue crabs, and the blue crabs are connected to crab boats. And crab boats are connected to crab and towns, and Crabbin towns are the marketplace for people who like to eat crabs. Oysters, too, that shallow bay bottom that grew them fat and tasty and so thick that special boats and gear evolved on the Chesapeake to catch them and a special breed of men to work them. Well, it's oysters and mud, neither nary or nigh. We're born and we work, and then we die. Ain't it hard times? Board of a drudge boat. Ain't it hard times? Susquehanna, Wicomico, South Severn Anacoke, Chop Tang and Elk, Patuxent, Potomac, and the old Shenandoah, York, Rapper, Hannock, and James. Oh, the York, Rapper, Hannock, and James. York, Rapper, Hannock, and James. You know, there's 40 rivers, <laughs> but one of them dwarfs them all. That's the Susquehanna. Coming down from Pennsylvania and New York, it's uh, half of the bay's fresh water. Without cleaning up the Susquehanna, we can never clean up the bay. Well, I grew up in Fishing Creek Valley, tributary to the Susquehanna right above Harrisburg. We spent most summer afternoons down splashing around the creek, turning rocks over looking for crayfish. I find myself trying to visualize standing down on the banks of the Susquehanna. Think about all that water and where it's coming from. Coming off the land or coming through the land, developments and towns and cities, coming from coal mines and fields, parking lots. The water's been a lot of places. It's fascinating to me to think about water and, and where it's coming from and where it's going. It really wasn't until 83 when the results of the big EPA study were released that we really knew about the critical importance of the Susquehanna to the Bay's ecosystem. I guess I, I almost felt a little defensive as a Pennsylvanian. I was just thinking, how can that be that we're harming the Bay? We've really got to do something up in Pennsylvania. Sixty milk cows, probably four ton a day. That's with the bedding, you know, mixed in with. That's every day, Christmas Day, New Year's. You're just thinking about getting the manure spread. Most of the conservation practices that the farmers put into effect are strictly economic. I think very few of them consider the impact of the folks downstream. My biggest thoughts were just strictly economics. We had to naturally put on more cows, and we had created a situation here that was not good, especially with Sinking Creek going right through the farm. 
where I got involved with Chesapeake Bay program was Soil Conservation Service stopped in one day and I was looking at this mess and evidently he was too. And then I talked over with the Chesapeake Bay representative and he told me what was they come down with the figures, how much they uh, were allowed to spend and I would have to spend a like amount and best management practices would have to be put in. But generally speaking, it would help me financially and also environmentally. These days it seems like uh, the old Susquehanna only runs downstream. But it didn't used to be uh, such a one-way street. It used to carry a spring tide upstream, a spawning rock and shad and herring. They ran all the way to the Binghamton and Elmira in New York State, and it was a nice gift to the top of the watershed for the tribute of its rivers. Dams and other obstruction began to end that connection about 150 years ago. In 1928, the big dam at Conowingo, uh, pretty word in that Conowingo, that plugged the last free-flowing stretch of the Susquehanna. Only now we're breaching the dams and releasing baby shad and trying to restore the thousands of miles of spawning water that uh, we've amputated from that watershed. Sun and soul and winds blow Though my bones are formed in mountains It's through my blood this here river flows Well drive You know, once water flowed into the bay, it was different. <laughs> the rain fell on the forest and the meadows and the swamps and marshes and percolated right down through that great green sponge through the leaves and the roots and the soil and then seeped out slow and clean and clear. In the bay you had the grasses and the oysters and they'd clarify and purify the water even more as it passed through their, their blades and over the gills of the oysters. From the watershed right on through to the water's bottom. This whole system was like a great living filter. Well, today, half the forest and half the wetlands are gone. Ninety percent of, of those grasses have died, and, and only about one percent of the oysters remain. People have changed it with their cutting and their plowing, their fishing and their paving, mostly uh, with their arrogance. And now people are trying to put it right again, to protect what's left, and they're trying to reduce their impacts on the land and the water. But more people are coming every day. In just a few decades, nearly three million more will be sharing this watershed. You know, we aren't any different from those swans and those herons and crabs and ducks and oysters. We love them edges where the land and water mingle, too. Well, look at where the people live in this uh, country. Those peaks are nearly two-thirds of uh, all the Americans who've already settled less than one hour's drive from the water's edges. And those peaks are swelling still. And the Chesapeake, with its long, lovely, and incredibly vulnerable edges, that, that are so attractive to us and to all the creation, is in the heart of the heart of this conflict. I was born in the Northern Neck. I've always lived in the Northern Neck. All of my forebears have lived there. There's no other place in the entire world to which I have any connection. I was 19 years old in 1952. I have a daughter who's 19 years old in 1991. And the difference between the condition of the area when I was 19 and when she is 19, it clearly means that somebody's got to do something about it. She's 19 and never caught a rockfish. And I think that's outrageous. We developed in Virginia and Maryland in the colonial period a concept of property rights that people would do with their land what was necessary to protect it and to make it productive. A philosophy that my land is mine to do with as I see fit. And I think what we must do now if we are going to protect our resources 
is to rethink the concept of property rights. And just as our First Amendment rights are not absolute, so property rights are not absolute. It's going to take long-range planning, planning for water resources, planning for highways, for transportation needs. We don't look at planning from the standpoint of decades. We cannot always be playing catch-up. The bay wants to live. If you ever hooked a rockfish or a shad and felt it tug for freedom, if you, if you ever tried to pry apart an oyster shells or had a big gym crab grab you by the finger, you, you know that's so. We can bring it back. We don't need a scientific breakthrough to tell us what to do. It's simply a matter of awe, letting yourself stand in awe of it. And then the respect for how it's all connected and then working to curb our own wasteful ways. Some would say, the, well, that means uh, trading your prosperity for economic ruin. But I'd say that the cure for gluttony isn't starvation. It's just learning to eat wisely. That won't be easy. We've got to reduce our impacts enough to offset all the added impacts from another few million people moving in in the next few decades. You know, much has been lost already. And the marvel is how, how much remains. <laughs>